So good, good evening and, and welcome to our first presentation of the year. I'm Brent Taylor, convener of the speaker program for Military History and Heritage Victoria. And on behalf of the committee, I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's Zoom event. The speaker tonight is Gary Fellowill, speaking about Operation Kingfisher, the cancelled rescue mission that sacrificed Sandakan POWs to the death marches. Um, now a little bit about Gary. Gary is a successful business owner of an international agricultural import-export company turned military historian and writer. He has a lifelong interest in history and in 2010 commenced a Master of Art degree in military history at the Australian Defence Force Academy in Canberra. And I was just talking to Gary and apparently the whole shebang up there has been relabeled and subsumed into New South Wales, but nevertheless, that's the, the degree that he, he did. Operation Kings, Kingfisher follows years of research at archives in Australia, Great Britain, and the United States of America. Gary uses previously unseen and recent released archival files to find the real story of the cancellation of the Sandakan POW rescue mission, Operation Kingfisher. Now, just a little bit of a process. Um, Gary will be answering questions at the end of the presentation, as per normal. You can ask questions in one of two ways. You can post on the chat message anytime up to and including question time and address the question to everyone. When the time comes, I'll read your question using whatever name appears on your uh, screen or your chat, um, chat handle. Or you can wait and put your hand up during question times and I'll invite you to ask your question verbally. So that's it for the process. Oh, no, firstly, Gary's happy for your screens to be on, but remember that everyone can also see you. Um, make sure your microphones are switched off. It becomes even more distracting if we can hear other people in the audience. And by now, you should be on speaker view. So I will invite Gary to take over and give us his presentation. Thank you, Brett. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the uh, Military History and uh, Heritage Society of Victoria for inviting me to come on tonight. Uh, it's my pleasure and an honour. I'd like to start with Operation Kingfisher in 1947. I know this is after the war, but nobody really knew about this rescue mission, except the people that had planned it were involved in it. But it was pretty hush-hush, and when it was canceled, it was pretty much buried until 1947, when General Sir Thomas Blamey attended the second annual conference of the Australian, Milita Australian Armour Corps conference and uh, got up to speak. And we don't know why he did this. Nobody's ever been able to put it. Maybe it was a whiskey too many. Maybe he saw it as a chance to really give back at MacArthur. In which he said, and I will look for the words. Uh, the rescue mission had been planned. It was fully resourced. We had the paratroopers to go in and rescue the POWs. But higher up command would not make the airplanes available. Higher up in command, of course, meant MacArthur. This hit the newspapers. This was on 21st November, 1947. On the 22nd of November, Melbourne newspapers picked up the story and it started to, went all the way to the Australian parliament. The Australian government denied any knowledge of any rescue plan. They said, no, we know of no rescue plan. No, never planned. Nothing has happened. No, I don't know what he's talking about. So we have a big cover up from our Australian parliament of a situation where there was actually a plan and an operation that had been approved. This followed on from finding out that the Japanese had issued orders that all POWs were not to fall in the hands of the allies. They were to be killed in any way. Uh, Jason, if you can bring up that next slide, please. This is a paybook 
a collage put together which sits in the Australian War Memorial. Uh, Paybook pay, uh, photos of all the Sandakan POWs that died on the death marches. This was put together by a number of military historians, including uh, my supervising professor, Dr. Peter Stanley. And it just brings it home. If you go to the Australian War Memorial, you can walk into a, a little room in the World War II section, and you'll be faced with 2,500 paybook photos and a video running in the background of the survivors. So they didn't learn about the killing of the POWs till American POWs in Palawan were put into a bunker and then petrol was thrown in and they were set alight. Most of them perished. If they tried to escape, they were shot, bayoneted, but some managed to escape and jump over a cliff and were rescued by Filipino guerrillas. They were able to get back to the Allied lines and tell them what had actually happened. This that put a whole new dimension to operations in the Pacific, in that all POWs had to be taken into consideration in any military planning. This included the Santa Can POWs, because of course, there were already plans for the Oboe range of invasions on Borneo, and the first one was only gonna be about 250 kilometers from the Santa Can POW camp. So they were concerned that they would be massacred. The interesting thing about the Japanese was the number of POW deaths under their control. In the war, of, war in Europe with the Germans, there was a total of 200 POW deaths in captivity. In Japan, there was a total of 8,000 31 POW deaths, half of the total deaths in the Pacific of Australians. So this made a, a very strong point in that if you wanted to get your POWs back, you were gonna to have to do something. And POW rescues were seen as the thing. Now, it comes down to the question, a lot of people said, was there a Kingfisher? Did it actually exist? What was the plan? Was it approved? Did MacArthur really not make the airplanes available? And I started on this mission with having bought a book called Project Kingfisher written by Atoll Moffat. Atoll Moffat was the chief prosecutor in Borneo in the war criminals trials of the people there. In 1989, he wrote a book called Project Kingfisher, in which he mainly detailed the trial details, the various war criminals he tried and the results and so forth. But he devoted a whole chapter to this mission Kingfisher. He got wind of. He didn't have a lot to work with. This is 1989. A lot of the files still hadn't been released yet. So he went with the blamey ex explanation of Yes, there was a plan to rescue the POWs. Yes, there was the Australian paratroopers ready to go, but MacArthur wouldn't make the airplanes available to take the paratroopers in and start the rescue mission. Another theory was by Lynette Silver with her conspiracy of silence. silence. She blamed Blamey for stuffing it all up. She said that it was Blamey's fault. He'd made so many mistakes. He couldn't go forward, the mission couldn't go forward because he just, he'd screwed it up, which we now know is not true. Michelle Cunningham, who wrote Hell on Earth, which primarily, both Silver and, and Cunningham's books were primarily about the POWs with a sideline on the rescue mission. And Lynette, uh, sorry, uh, Michelle Cunningham said, it was not a rescue mission, it was a reconnaissance mission uh, to look at the possibility of rescuing the POWs. But if you see the actual approved plans for Kingfisher, at the very end, it says, the RECI team will board the ships with the POWs to be taken back to the larger ships and to Australia. And that right there tells you there was a real mission. 
And then there's uh, the son of one of the escapees, Richard Braithway. He had a number of different reasons that he put forward that the mission wouldn't come, go ahead. Uh, the, he said the Australian operatives were inexperienced, didn't know what they were doing. And so they just sort of muddled it up and it couldn't go ahead. But in my research, I found that when Brigadier Willis took over the SRD, our Special Reconnaissance Department, which was the Australian equivalent of the SOE, he went to MacArthur with this plan, this rescue plan in December 1944. And the plan was actually approved. Uh, next photo, please. And it was fully resourced. Uh, there's our favorite general, General Blamey with MacArthur. And the plan also uh, had the full backing of MacArthur. MacArthur had a strong feeling about POWs. During February, March, after the invasion of the Philippines by MacArthur, he sent troops behind enemy lines for three POW civilian internees rescues in the Philippines. He did the Great Raid in Catabatu, where Army Rangers and Filipino uh, guerrillas went behind the lines, rescued 500 POWs in very bad condition under the noses of the Japanese. He then went to Los Baños, where he had paratroopers drop in. And this is the amazing thing. This plant almost followed Kingfisher to the dot. The only difference was they took the POWs out and the civilian internees with Amtraks, tracked vehicles that could go on land and water, as opposed to the Kingfisher plan, which was to take them out from Sandakan by landing craft. And then the final one was he sent a team or troops into Manila to rescue POWs and civilian internees ahead of his main force. And so they basically ran in there, saved all these people. They even had to negotiate with the Japanese holding some POWs and he said that they would give them free passage to the edge of town if they would let the POWs and civilian internees go. So MacArthur was very keen on rescuing POWs. He saw it as a, a sort of a mission to save our people. So there's no doubt that he would not have not made those airplanes available. Um, I've got some pictures here of some memos just to back that up, uh, going past that one, yes. Uh, it's not a very good copy, but as you can see, uh, you can hopefully make out that we have a memo to the Allied uh, naval force telling them to make all available uh, resources to the rescue plan. And then there's another one which follows on, please. And that one shows the air making to the commander of the Allied Air Force in the Pacific to make the airplanes available. During my research, I went through the aircraft availability from January 45 to May 45 and found on average there was about 600 aircraft suitable for this rescue mission every month. C-47, C-46, gliders, and a variety of other aircraft. So making the aircraft available was, was not one of the main points. So from there, I went to the actual report of the operations for Agus, Agus 1 and Kingfisher. Agus 1 was supposed to enter into Borneo in a different direction. It was supposed to go first, Kingfisher second, Agus 2, the second, the third mission was still third. But a major Chester, who was actually working for SOE, a British Secret Service, was in charge of Agus 1. And they went by submarine. And when they got to the drop-off point in uh, Borneo, they saw what they thought was two radio masts and aborted the landing and managed to get back to Australia. 
What they didn't know, because they hadn't done a flyover, was there was actually two burnout palm trees. So they could have gone ashore. When he got back to Australia, they had a meeting and they decided to combine Agus One and Kingfisher into one mission, but with separate leaders. So Chester was going to go in, continue his mission of going around Borneo, reestablishing British relations, setting up a semi government, so forth. And Kingfisher, which was headed up by Jock Sutcliffe, also SOE. Uh, was to continue on with his mission to go to Santa Can, get the last minute intel, and feed it back for the rescue mission. They needed to know how many troops were there, how many anti-craft guns were there, what was the layout, where was a good landing spot. That's all they had to do. But when you read the report, the post-op report, Kingfish and I guess both landed, set up camp upriver, and this is where it gets funny. There's no mention of any discussion about who's going to do what. Sutcliffe just went with Chester and went opposite direction from Sandakan. Never even attempted to go to Sandakan to get the last minute intel. It's a big mystery. While they're doing their rounds going away from Sandakan, they came across a local chief who told them, oh, Santa Can's all empty, the POWs have all gone, which they transmitted back to Australia. And so, in effect, that canceled Operation Kingfisher. No POWs, nobody to rescue. But they were working on false information. You have to remember in Borneo, there's no telephones, there's no TV, there's no. So somebody tells you something, you believe it because that's just what it is. You're not telling lies. Somebody told you that and somebody tells you this and it's all part of the network of information. But what had happened really was they sent the first 500 in January of the Santa Can POWs to act as porters to take equipment, food and so forth to run out. And any rescue mission would not have been able to rescue them. So because the Allies believed that Santa Can POW camp was empty. On May 19th, they sent in PT boats, which bombed the port of Santa Can and the town and set off alarm bells among the Japanese. And the Japanese saw this as the prelude to an invasion of Santa Can. And thus started death marches two and three. So by not going to Santa Can, Sutcliffe basically sealed their fate, he said. So we get into the point of why would Sutcliffe not go to Santa Can to get the information, which he was ordered to do. He actually disobeyed a direct order to go there. And it, derived, it goes back to he was an SOE, a British agent, as was Chester. So whose orders were they following? London's. So we then have to go back before the war and look at well, what's what's going on here. And in 1941 in uh, Nova Scotia, there was a meeting between Roosevelt and Churchill. And from that meeting came out the Atlantic Charter. And the Atlantic Charter stated point seven and eight was that all nations and countries should be able to have self-government and should be able to choose government of their choice, which was totally against what Winston Churchill wanted. He needed his colonies. He was terribly in debt and he knew he would need them after the war. But he felt if this self-government and self-determination didn't apply to his colonies, the British colonies, I should say. And so he continued to make plans and in these plans in 1942, the Malaysian planning unit started planning. This is 1942 when everything is going against the British. They're losing all their holdings in Asia. They're not doing that great in the war in Europe. And they started the Malaysian planning unit to plan for coming back after the war to take over their previous colonies in Singapore, Malaya, Borneo, uh, Hong Kong and everything. 
and it all had to be done without Roosevelt knowing. And so you had two very good leaders at opposite ends of the spectrum. Roosevelt wanted the countries to have self-determination, self-government, and Churchill was a, an imperialist. He, he, no way he was gonna let go of those colonies. So it then became a, a, a story of how do we grab, reestablish our government in these Asian colonies without the Americans knowing. And so it then came down to, they had to hide what they were doing from the Americans. And there was a good quote uh, in one of the books that I read where an SOE agent said to Gibbs, Gibbons, the head of SOE, that they were making two sets of plans for every operation they did from Australia. One set would go to MacArthur's office, which would be approved. They put that plan in the drawer and they'd pull out the real plan they wanted to do. This, this went on a number of times. And this kept going on and it would, it would just, it became a point where the secret services, the OSS of America and the SOE of, of Britain were actually fighting more against each other than they were against the Japanese because the war had reached a stage where neither one of them could do much in the war. So they were fighting for land and territory in Asia. Um, the, the, one of the key things as well was when they set up uh, Special Operations Australia, which then became known as the Allied Intelligence Bureau and Special Reconnaissance Department, so was manned by a number of SOE agents. So the British had a major influence on the uh, operations, of secret operations, I should say, out of Australia into Asia in the areas they could control. And, but to get what they wanted, they had to keep it hidden from MacArthur. And this was a key thing. And MacArthur kept trying and reorganizing the, the group to get more and more control. He was doing this through his uh, chief of intelligence, Charles Willoughby. And he, uh, he kept trying, but they would just somehow circumvent him and, and go and do what they wanted. And it was a mess. So in the end, what the British wanted to do, their main goal was to get into Borneo, get teams in there, Agus 1, Agus 2, Agus 3 of operatives, to reestablish a form of government. They even set up a hospital for the locals in the bush because they obviously couldn't go to the coastal areas. They were bringing in medicine, they were bringing in food so that they would be established in Borneo if the Americans decided to invade Borneo and take it over. They wanted to say, well, we're already here. And this, this is where it comes down to what killed the rescue mission. And it was because Sutcliffe didn't go and do what he was supposed to do and get the intel, which would have kicked off the rescue mission. The planes were ready, the ships were ready, everything was ready to go, but he just didn't go. And the only reason he didn't go was because he was following orders from London, which was to go with Chester and establish this semi-government. Now, the interesting, other interesting point in this is what, what I found out when I went to the UK, uh, to the UK archives, is that Sutcliffe's file was not released till 2016. That's a long time since the war, end of World War II for his particular file to be released. And that was what brought it all together for me in saying, this is what killed the rescue mission. And uh, so from that point of view, that's what the book is based on. Um, and so basically that's that's all I can say at this stage but I'm open to questions because I'm sure I've missed a lot of areas uh, this is the memo from uh, Chester and Sutcliffe reliable information from a native chief in the Sugut area which is about 250 kilometers from Sandakan indicates the Sandakan POWs have been moved in groups to Jesselton, which was not true. All right.
The middleman there is Major Chester. This is how they would travel to try and appear native, but as you can see, they still stock out quite predominantly, uh, which would make it difficult for them to appear to travel freely in Borneo. And last photo. And there is Captain Derek Jock Sutcliffe, the man who didn't do his job. And this is the picture from the HMS Prince of Wales Day in the Atlantic Conference, 10th of August, 1941, where the Atlantic Charter was signed. Um, Churchill was just so keen to get the U.S. and get more aid from the U.S., he would have said anything. He was in a very bad state at that time. And the last photo, I think, is there. MacArthur and Australian Prime Minister John Curtin. And Curtin basically turned over the war effort to MacArthur. He shut Blamey out and just did his, told Curtin and Snedden what it needed to be done. And they pretty much followed what he said. All right. So I will open the floor to questions now, Brett. Yes, thank you, Gary. Um, yes, by all means, uh, there's no questions in the chat. So uh, does anyone have in the, uh, any questions from the floor? Oh, that was shortened. Oh, okay. Graham. Yeah, uh, Graham. Graham. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yep. Thank you. I'm just wondering, the, these guys from um, British SOE, I, I know that our, our, our blokes didn't have a lot of experience in the jungle either, but did the SOE guys have any experience in, in, in the jungle and living in the jungle and dealing with native tribes and so forth? I mean, um, you know, if they were trained to parachute into Paris or France or something at some stage, how, how did they go in those duties out in, out in um, um, you know, the Pacific uh, theatre? Yeah, um, Major Chester was actually in World War One. He, he resigned from the Army after World War One. moved to Borneo. He actually lived in Santa Cana as a manager of a rubber plantation. Uh, yeah. So he lived there. Yeah. Another one of the SRD agents, stroke SOE agents, was a Major Tom Harrison. You may come across him in your readings. He had gone to Borneo as a professor to do uh, to gather information and knowledge on dialects, tribal knowledge, and so forth. And he ran, I guess, no, Cement. He ran Cement 1 and 2. And he was very... At the end of the war, he was very instrumental in chasing down the Japanese that refused to surrender after the war. Uh, so they did have some people that were very knowledgeable uh, in jungle warfare and in, and in Borneo as well. They also used locals that were based in Australia. They would take them back as well. But they had a lot of trouble uh, because, as I said, they stuck out like sore thumbs when you walk around in the jungle. It's not a very forgiving place. No, no. At least if you're in Germany or France, you can blend in a little bit, can't you? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. And yes, Andrew. Andrew. Uh, your your mic's off, Andrew. Yeah, got it. Thank you, uh, and, and thanks very much, uh, Gary. That was fascinating. I'm fortunate enough to have been to Santa Can a couple of times, and um, I, I meant not walk the march, but um, I was fascinated by um, one of the characters who comes into play during the Japanese occupation were um, Agnes Newton Keith and her husband, and he, of course, was a uh, um, he was involved with a British company. Uh, you inferred that the Brits were. Um, fairly widespread throughout Borneo at the time of the Japanese invasion. What surprises me is that, um, so there were resident Brits who were capable of providing information about what was going on 
in Sandakan and why there was a feeling that um, SOE had to go in to establish or, or rely on a local chief uh, and not take any cognizance perhaps of um, the local Brits who were resident throughout the Japanese occupation and presumably had some fairly good intelligence on uh, what the Japanese were up to. Did there were, appear? yeah, yeah, there were some Brits living in Sandakan. Uh, there was the doctor and a few others. But when the Japanese discovered the radio and uh, a couple of weapons and ammunition during a search, all they were all sent to Jesselton um, to be interrogated by the Kimpatai. And so there was no real British left in Sandakan. They removed them all. They also took most of the officers from the POW camp so they couldn't organize any sort of escape or resistance or anything else like this. A key issue with the Japanese is when the airstrip became unusable, they began reducing the, the rations to the prisoners. It was too, because they were running out of food, but they also wanted to keep the prisoners weak so they couldn't attack them or make an escape or anything like this. They were just so weak, they couldn't do anything. And this was another form of control used by the Japanese in a number of different POW camps. Um. Gary, I, uh, Kevin Point and calling. I popped a question in the chat box. What happened? Uh, what was the outcome of the Chester Sutcliffe operation post the decision not to pursue Sandakan? Well, this is it. There's no mention in the operation report of anything about Sandakan. There's no mention of, I was supposed to go to Sandakan or my orders were. It, just no mention of Sandakan at all, except that message where they met the local chief and he said, they've all gone, the POWs have all gone, which of course was not true. So as a result of that, uh, Death March 2 took another roughly, they took them out in groups of 50. And the second one was, I don't have the, I have to look at my numbers, sorry, I should know it by heart. Uh, the last Death March, Death March 3, they struggled to get very many people at all. In fact, most of the ones they could get to march because it, this is the people that were, the POW was the weakest. They were very sick, very, just had no energy at all. So they remained, about 300 remained at the camp because they just couldn't march. And of course, or unfortunately, they were killed. They were put in a mass grave and burned. And the ones that left didn't make it very far. In the death marches, it was either you marched or you died. If you sat down and didn't get up, you were killed by the Japanese. They came up behind you. Uh, it was, it was, the plan was not to have any POWs surviving. And in fact, after the war, after the surrender of the Japanese, there are a number of stories of the remaining POWs that ran out were actually taken out and shot and bayoneted. There was about 19 of them left. And this is after the surrender. So it's it's a very sad story all the way around. Thank you. Um, There's a question from John Davies in the chat, Brent. Yep. Um, I have two archival questions uh, to Gary about location of his sources. Um, do you can you answer that, Gary? With that. Which sources are you talking about? John, would you mind? Um... Uh, can I speak here? Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Yeah, oh, thanks. Uh, Gary, I'm very interested to know uh, how much of your source material came from the US uh, National Archives and Records Administration at uh, College Park in Maryland. Yeah, um, I'd say I probably got more information from the UK archives, the National Australian Archives, and the Australian War Memorial. Uh, I did get a copy of the approved Kingfisher plans from NARA in the US. Yeah. 
Um, I've got some uh, good information on uh, Charles Willoughby and some good information on MacArthur. But the one that really put it all together was from the UK archives. And that's where I was able to find the information. There was uh, Chester, there was Sutcliffe, and then there was their uh, commander, which was Mark Chapman Walker. He was a very unusual fellow and featured heavily into a lot of this planning. So I'm sure he's tarred with the same brush as the other two. I would have said he would have told them what to do, but for the record said, this is what you have to do. Did you have to go over there to the public records uh, office or that's the old name for it in the UK? Yeah. Uh, I was lucky in that I was working in those days with my own company and I did have to do a lot of travel. Um, so I was able to tack on visits to NARA in the US and the UK archives. Uh, in the UK, I also went to the MacArthur Memorial Library in Norfolk, Virginia. I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful city if you ever get to America. Um, and I combined it with business travel. So in that in that point of view, I was kind of lucky in that I didn't have to go cap in hand to the university and say, can I please have some money to go travel? Well, thank you. There's a question here from Tony Hastings. Could you can could you give a brief description of the Kingfisher plan? Kingfisher plan detailed the re reconnaissance team's mission. So they were on, once they hit Borneo, they were on a D minus 17 day. So they had like 17 days to get from landing to Sandakan, get the information. They had to get back to the camp to feed that information back to the radio operators. These radio operators didn't, didn't go with them. They had to go back to the camp, feed that information in, and then from there, they would go back to Santa Can and help with the paratroopers coming in, help get the POW, because it was about a mile or two from the POW camp to the port of Santa Can. They had good wharfs, they had sandy beaches, so it wasn't an issue with getting the POWs out of Sandakan, but it was a question of you had to it mentioned commandeering as many vehicles as possible because a lot of the POWs would be terribly weak um, in the great way where they rescued the POWs in uh, the Philippines they actually got a bunch of the Filipinos with their ox carts to transport the POWs because they were so weak back to allied lines well, this is the same situation at Santa Cat. They were going to need some form of transport to go back and forth. Um, it was, they gave us a very detailed list of what information they needed. Guns, what were the troops like? Were they Japanese troops? Were they Korean troops? Were they Taiwanese or Formosan troops? Uh, how well armed were they? Uh, there was a lot of this going on there and they needed this information. Because at that stage, they estimated there was about 150 Japanese guards and troops there, Japanese, Korean, Formosan. And we're talking about 800. The Australian Parachute Troop uh, Brigade was about 850 men. So it would have been easy for them to overpower. They would have had plenty of time to make their escape because the other Japanese troops were hours away. So the plan was very, very workable. And they just needed that last minute intelligence, which they didn't get. And the reason they didn't get it is because the reconnaissance team didn't go and do what they were supposed to do. And the reason they didn't do what they were supposed to do, they're up acting on orders from the British government through SOE. Hmm. Uh, Chris Murphy's got a question. Yes. This is Yes, Chris. Do you want to, Chris, do you want to turn the mic on and ask it yourself, or shall I do it? Well, I have to um, unmute myself. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, well, look, uh, if this is uh, my comment. Is it's not really related to um, the Operation Kingfisher, and thanks for your talk, by the way, too, Gary. Very interesting. But... Um, in your sort of reading, 
Um, a figure uh, whose name I've seen crop up a few times is um, Robert Jock McLaren, who escaped from Bahala Island in 1943. I that, that's my understanding. And then he went on to serve with the sort of Philippines forces for some time and I think Z Special Forces. Um, so is he a figure that you've come across and is everything that um, it seems he says about himself um, true it, from your experience? My reading of the gentleman is that, yes, he was genuine. He did escape. He did fight with the uh, Filipino guerrillas. The information he gave them on the Santa Can POW camp was very detailed and very good, but it was from 1943. And we were talking end of 1944, early 1945. So a lot of things could have changed in that time period from when he escaped to when they were planning the rescue mission. So that's why they needed people to go back in and just see what was actually there at the time. Look, if I, I may follow up, one of one of the stories I, I like, as I understand it, he escaped three times from Japanese um, custody, and there would be very few people um, who managed to do that and survived, and yet he did. And one of his stories, I believe, he was served as a veterinarian in the. Um, uh, First World War, but at one stage he um, he he says that um, he had appendicitis and he operated on himself and removed his own appendix and it just you know like yeah if if he did that um you know um it, it just seems like an extraordinary um story as I said not strictly related to uh, Operation Kingfisher but a, an amazing story all the same. Yes, he actually, McLaren actually wanted to go back in as part of the reconnaissance team. He felt he should be able to go back, but for some reason he was knocked back and was never considered. Uh, he felt he, he would have a lot to offer simply because he'd been there before and he knew the layout, but uh, for whatever reason, they, he was not included in the mission. Um uh, Uh, are there any other questions? Raman, can you can you, you turn your mic on, please? There we go. Ah. Yeah, are you hearing me, Gary? Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks very much uh, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I really enjoy the history of military. It's coming from uh, uh, growing up in the Indian subcontinent. The old revolution happened there. Uh, uh, you, you rise in the very interesting uh, the point. Uh, is a relationship between in America and and Britain. So Britain want to stay there after the war or whatever the reason. Uh, but at the same time, the whole reason, uh, like in Bengal, that Nataji Shuvarch on the uh, he's collaborating with, uh, with with the Japanese. The British have to be go from India. Shukorno in the in, in Indonesia. Ho Chi Minh in the beside that. Uh, how these people revolutionary the play the role. Uh, when that particular things happen in Sanda Khan or the Japanese uh, or the British, uh, uh, they like to stay there. They don't like to be give up. Uh, uh, do you know anything about that scenario? Um, well, this was this India particularly was a very sore point between uh, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill. Roosevelt was pushing Churchill to grant the Indian nation more freedom not lock up so many of the pro-independence people and so forth. And even uh, the ruler, the current, the ruler at the time of China, Chiang Kai-shek, got involved in this question of independence for India. And Churchill was, there was a meeting in, I think it was Yalta, in which they started discussing taking India and giving it independence, despite what the British wanted. And Churchill just... He blew up in the meeting and he was he sat down and all he could say was never, never, never while I'm prime minister, never will India be free. But of course, we now know, even though they did get back their colonies after the war, the nations there had already tasted something. They'd seen the British weren't invincible anymore. And so it was only a question of a 10, 20 years. And all these countries have now got independence in the 60s. 
so he, Churchill in the end was really fighting a losing battle. But don't forget, he needed the money at the end of the war. Britain was was so in debt to America. America was giving them lots of war material and aid and so forth, but they were charging them for it. They were they wanted their money, you know. Britain had no gold reserves left. They had no money left. So they needed the rubber, the tin, the oil. They needed all these revenues to build back up their coffers. And uh, that's why Churchill kept going. And India was was just a jewel in the crown. And that was the last thing he wanted to give up. And yes, it's true. Mm. A lot of Indians did join the Japanese in fighting the British. They had whole brigades of them. It wasn't very pleasant for them, though, when the Japanese lost. Um, yeah, please continue. I, I think we'll take one more question and then, because we're sort of drifting a little bit off the off topic. Um, Kevin Point is asking a question about Jack Sue. Is it related to Sandakan, Kevin? Uh, yes, it is. Having lived in Western Australia for a number of years, there was a commando who was Chinese-Australian named Jack Su, distinguished West Australian, who wrote a book called Blood on Borneo, in which he claimed to have been part of a reconnaissance to understand the situation at Santa Can. And in latter years, that version was disputed. I'm just wondering if Gary's research uncovered anything about Jack and that particular dimension. Jack uh, was actually part of the Agas-1 mission, which was combined with Kingfisher. So he was actually there with uh, Chester and with Sutcliffe. Unfortunately, when he wrote that book, he was quite well-aged. Well, he was advanced in years, let's say. And i do not not sure how well his memory was. It was a lot. Of, he still retained a lot of good information, a lot of valuable facts. But and I know there had been a court case between Lynette Silver and Jack Suli, uh, which I'm not going to touch on. But it was over something he said, and then she said, and so forth. But no, he he did uh, did go on that mission. He in his writings he mentioned Sutcliffe and how much he hated him. He said he was a, what did he say? He's a lazy bastard. He wouldn't do his fair share and so forth. Uh, but yeah, he did feature big in the Agas-1 movement, um, mission. Thank you. All right, I think we, we might draw this to a close. Um, uh, thank you very, very much, That's Gary. Right. We're, we're looking forward to having your book um, come out. And um, it was excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. I'm going to now um, go, move on to um, some of our business. Gary, if you want to leave, feel free to feel free to stay and listen. You can join us if you like. Um, but, but there's a couple of other notices that we've got um, need to talk about. And then before I close the meeting, if you, well, I'll just say thank you all very much. Um, I really enjoyed being able to present this to you and I enjoyed the questions. They were good questions. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, if you think of any other questions, I'm sure you can get my email address from Brent and please feel free to give me a call or send me an email and I'll answer your questions. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Gary. Good night. Good night. So um, just a few notices. You'll see here that we've got a uh, Game of Dominoes, Australia's Security and, and the Cold War, 1947 and 1991. We it's a two-day conference um, uh, that will be on uh, on the Saturday the 13th and Sunday the 14th of April. And as you can see on the bottom, early bird tickets close this Saturday. Um, so if you're wanting to get to come and um, with a bit of a discount, by all means, you'll have to book by the Saturday. But we encourage you to come. It's going to be a great conference, two days and, a, and with dinner. Um, the next uh, event on, on the speaker program will be by speaker Rosalie Triolo. Um, from books and blackboards to battlefields, um, 
I've got a little note about Rosemary, who's an, an, an adjunct senior lecturer at Monash University, who writes and presents widely on the history of education, the history of Australian education and Australian history generally, as well as World War I. And I'm, she's going, as you can see what the title is, I'm particularly interested in this picture because this is uh, Melbourne high school teachers and pupils, previously cadets, that um, going off to war. So the teachers and the and the new and the, their pupils mixed on on the way to war. Um, so I'm sure it'll be a, a fascinating presentation. That's on Wednesday, the 15th of May, same time. So that'll be an excellent presentation. Rosalie, uh, um, Rosalie is a, a very experienced presenter. So this brings us even, the evening session to a close. Thanks again to Gary. Thanks to Jason, who always keeps things going behind the scenes. And thank you all for joining us. And uh, hope you come again. And I hope to see you at the two-day conference.